Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Shared Stories series. My name is Sharonica Gavin, and I'm the Community Education Manager for the AF Association in the U.S. Here with me today, I have an amazing patient of ours by the name of Barbara. Hi, Barbara. How are you today? Hi, Sharonica. I'm okay, thank you. Awesome. Today, me and Barbara will walk through a series of questions that will provide benefits, education, and support to AFib patients. So here we go. All right, Barbara, the first question is, when were you first diagnosed with AF? That's a very interesting one because I was actually first diagnosed in 2009 and I was actually working for voluntary service overseas in Namibia. And it was just an accident that I was diagnosed because I actually went for an x-ray on my chest because I'd fallen. That's when they discovered I had an enlarged heart and that's when everything started. But I realize now that previously I'd had undiagnosed AF and I must have had it for at least since 2000. Um, my personal trainer during that time pointed out my high heart rate when I was exercising. And when I had um, a procedure, the anesthetist said, oh, you have a little bit of an irregular heartbeat, but don't worry about it. And that's probably where it started. <laughs> probably. Oh, goodness. That's, that's very interesting. Um, the next question that we have for you um, is, how has being diagnosed with AF kind of changed or affected your life? Well, as I said, I wasn't living in the UK when it was diagnosed. I was on an assignment for 18 months, an assignment from my teaching job in the UK. So when I came back, I intended to continue teaching. But because I teach special needs and they develop an attachment towards you, I couldn't do that. It wouldn't be fair to them because I was having to have too much time off in the initial diagnosis time and there's too much uncertainty. So that was unexpected to me. Also, the relationship that you have with your family and friends changes. My husband found it really difficult to deal with. He was in denial, then he was angry, then he was very resistant, and were very resistant until he became to accept more and understand more. I must say, he still gets a bit angry about it, but I tell him, I think I was lucky to be diagnosed then because my grandmother died of a stroke when she was 62. Mm. Also, my sons are fearful for me. Um, and that's hard to deal with because you always want to be strong and protective of your children. So, but I've never let it affect travel. I think it's fantastic that warfarin has been largely replaced by DOAX. Um, the problem is that now I'm not a mom or a wife or a teacher. I seem to be a person who has AF. And I seesaw from being filled with hope to feeling helpless, because it's the first thing that my friends ask about me, um, about my health. And the only other thing is how it's affected my life, is some of the medication, in particular, the diuretics, which I can't stand, <laughs> but I have to have them. And everything has to be planned around that. But as I said, even with all that, since diagnosis and before pandemic, we travel to Canada, Alaska, Hong Kong, China, you know, haven't let it stop me because that could so easily be the case. Right. I think you touch on a very important point of how AFib doesn't just affect that patient, but everyone around them, where spouses have to then, you know, step up or, you know, be kind of that main supporter for um, their partner, as well as children. The transition of, as, as a mother myself, you know, knowing how you are that protector for your child and, and the, them, for them to kind of transition into being like, mom, we're worried about you. Um, I think the plus is you have such a supportive family from what you've told us. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. The next question that we have for you, Barbara, is what therapy options did you choose? To begin with, it wasn't a case of me choosing. 
I totally reply, uh, relied on what the doctors told me. And I did exactly as I was told. Gotcha. <laughs> so I had the medication, first of all, which in those days began with aspirin, which wouldn't be touched nowadays. Then I had the cardioversion, and it wasn't until I was introduced to my electrophysiologist that I began to see that I had much, I had as much to input to my therapy options as he did, as any medic did. And that's when I started to take control back. Right. He was very, very good and said, look, we're on a, we're building, building blocks of a house here. We're starting here. I'm going to do an ablation. It probably won't be the first. Don't worry, we have a plan for the second. And so it's gone on. And since then, then I started taking control. That's beautiful. Um, I think it's so important. And as an organization, the AF Association plays a strong, puts a strong focus and emphasis on patients being a part of their care pathway. It's, it's, it's up to you, as you stated. I think the most beautiful thing is that you are a part of like a stepping stone. We're going to work together to come up with the best solution for you. And keeping in mind that every patient is different, you yeah. know, but having that healthcare professional who's like, no, no, you're in control just as much as I am. I think that's so important. You touch on a point of when you first, from first being diagnosed until now of how it was like, no, I just did what I was told. And now you, you, you say you took control of it. It's your life. It is your condition. Um, but you have the power and you have the control and you get that through education, you know? Absolutely. The, the forum, which I'm going to mention later, has been life changing for me. It's been my support network and I, I tell everybody about it. And also, it's also made me aware that uh, a med medics in other disciplines, say if I go into hospital for a hip replacement, will not have the knowledge about my heart. Mm -hmm. So there have been occasions when I've been on a DOAC and the nurse has come in and I said, what are you doing? Because you're taking blood. Oh, I'm testing your INR. No, you're not, I say. <laughs> and it's kind of, it's not, they need more training. You have to not be scared of speaking up. Right. <laughs> Definitely. We're going to transition into our next question. Um, and it is, what lifestyle changes have you made following diagnosis? And you touched on a little bit of this back in question two, but whatever you wish to share at this moment will definitely be beneficial. With lifestyle, I think people think about eating the wrong things, drinking too much, not exercising, smoking. Controversially, I have changed basically nothing because I've always eaten healthily. I've always battled with my weight. And I've always done as much as I can to help that and to continue exercising. I know that some people think that changing and it can help. What happens, what is good for me, needn't be the right choice for somebody else. So that's what you always have to think when I'm reading about people and listening to them. I think that's interesting. I'll take that bit, but I don't think I'll bother with that bit because that's not really me. As far as I'm aware, I have no triggers. It's totally inherited. My mother, my grandmother, that's as far back as we can go. The only thing I've changed is I take magnesium um, for, to help heart health and B12 to help with lethargy. It's never been suggested by my GP, my cardiologist or my EP that I do anything differently, bless them, like lose a lot of weight, which I would love to. Um, so I'm happy with that. Other people I know have made huge lifestyle changes. What does concern me is that some people might take these lifestyle changes and that will take away their quality of life more than the AF might. It's a balance. Gotcha. Definitely. It's all a balance and everything in moderation. Definitely. Our next question is, what are the challenges of living with AF during a pandemic? 
I don't know. How I was going to answer at the weekend is different to how I'm going to answer now. <laughs> Seeing as the UK is just about to go into a second lockdown. Personally, at the moment, the huge differences for me is that I don't just have, have AF. I have some other pending operations and procedures. And those have been delayed. Um, the other thing is that some procedures will not go ahead if I am in AF. So at the moment, I'm in sinus rhythm because I was supposed to have an ablation in March. That didn't happen. And I still haven't had it. Um, hopefully, it might be next March, says my EP. In the meantime, he gave me a cardio version. So I'm in sinus rhythm. So I'm due to have a procedure on my spine in the no, in middle of this month, only if I'm in sinus rhythm. And so because of also, are they going to go ahead with the procedure? So I think the whole pandemic thing has made the anxiety more. Um, the delays, the, um, I'm very reluctant to be around people in case, in case I catch something, says my husband. I have lost an awful lot of confidence and have become more anxious and more fearful. Um, at the beginning in March, um, my husband bought one of these, uh, what you call it, I've got to look it up, portable home oxygen generator, just in case. Not many people will have those sitting in their wardrobe upstairs, will they, just in case? No, so, no. <laughs> I suppose you could say that's one of the results of having AF in a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> a loving husband, Barbara, a loving husband. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I could have thought of something better for my birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> right. All righty. So the next question and our final question is, what advice would you give to a newly diagnosed AF patient? Be informed. Join the AF forum. Get second opinions if you don't feel confident what you've been told or you're being or the person who's telling you. That's one other thing that's just popped into my head. I've met with two new consultants, one for my eyes and one for my back on Zoom. And you just don't get the same kind of interaction, the same feeling. Um, that I did do when I met, say, my EP. So if you're not comfortable with them, don't think, oh, I can't change or he must be right. Um, when you are informing yourself of your condition, don't make sudden changes. It's like um, weaning a baby. Um, if you give them lots and lots of different foods and they have a reaction, you don't know what the effect is. Is it the banana or is it the cabbage? So don't make changes, make them slowly because um, your AF is very individual. Make your own choices. It was very difficult for me to talk to my husband to begin with, but that was a natural choice. And I didn't know anybody else with AF at that time. So that's where the forum came in exceedingly handy. And I had tried other forums before that weren't as balanced at all. The other important thing is to keep a detailed record of everything, every consultation, every blood test, every echo, every ECG, because you would be amazed how often you need it. I keep a, um, a hard copy in my handbag. I also have it on my computer. I have it in the cloud. And it has been worth its weight in gold. So many times, even for other procedures like the hip replacement, they've taken the hard copy, looked at it and said, oh, wow, can we copy this? <laughs> and it's been very, very helpful for them. Um, wear a wristband uh, or keep information about your AF somewhere on you, in a bag, something like that. 
remember that even if you are not in AF, as I am not at the moment, Touchwood, you're still a patient with AF. So things like avoiding adrenaline injections at the dentist, NSIs, ibuprofen, is still holds. And medics, if you're involved, God forbid, in an accident or something, would still need to know. Um, and the other one is that it's not an instant fix, if it's a fix at all. It's all about medications and uh, procedures, about improving your quality of life. It's a journey. It's a journey, but it doesn't have to be lonely. Exactly. That was beautiful, Barbara. Beautiful. I want to say a huge thank you to you for your time, um, your ability to even share your journey with other patients. We always encourage patients to know um, just how important it is to share their stories because it provides so much support, empathy, information um, for other patients, whether they are on a journey to becoming diagnosed or maybe just newly diagnosed. Um, I think it's so important. You touched on several different points about how families, it's not just a patient being affected, but it's a family being affected. Talking about how you, you took control of your journey through this AF um, situation and still taking control, which is beautiful. You touched on how the forum, so the AF Association Health Unlock Forum provides so many benefits to patients. Um, and, and you just, you bring a unique patient journey. As one electrophysiologist stated um, one time when I was speaking with him, he said, if you've taken care of one AF patient, you've only taken care of one AF patient. Everyone's journey is so different. So these shared stories provide so much more for patients because your journey isn't going to be the same as mine and mine won't be the same as yours. Um, I want to remind everybody, if you're looking for support, education, or resources regarding atrial fibrillation, please reach out to the AF Association. You could do that by email. You can do that by phone. Remember, we are always here to provide awareness, education, resources, and support. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Sharonka.